Uh, so Nicole, if you want to go ahead and start your screen sharing. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Nicole Shu, uh, who is an expert in bioengineering, having received uh, bioengineering BS from the University of Pennsylvania, an MS from Caltech, uh, and most recently a PhD from Stanford University. Uh, using her interdisciplinary background in mechanical engineering, robotics, fluid mechanics, organismal biology, neurobiology, and locomotion, Dr. Chu's recent work in biohybrid robotics has focused on the robotic control of jellyfish swimming. Uh, using portable microelectronics, she demonstrated that a biohybrid robotic jellyfish can swim um, uh, very fast. I, I don't want to give spoilers to the talk uh, in both laboratory and real world environments. Uh, she is now a National Research Council Research Associate at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. Nicole, thank you so much for being here with us today. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction. So hello, everyone. As Vicki explained, my name is Nicole, and today I'll be talking about the robotic control of live jellyfish swimming and experiments that we conducted both in the laboratory and in the Atlantic Ocean. And this is work for my PhD with John DeBerry at Stanford and Caltech, lots of moves in between the universities, uh, as well as our colleagues and scientific scuba divers at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole. So the overarching goal of our research is to expand on the tools and capabilities we have to learn more about the ocean. Even though we know that the ocean is crucial for things like regulating the climate, modulating oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, and providing goods like food, medicine, and transportation, we really only know a, literally a drop in the ocean. So over 80% of our ocean is still unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored. And by understanding more about the natural processes and man-made changes to the ocean, we can do more for ocean conservation and combating climate change. So the current unpiloted vehicles we have for ocean monitoring include using ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, and AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles. And these vehicles have many advantages. So they, they can travel fast speeds over long distances and be used for data collection, such as ocean floor mapping or deep sea exploration to, to discover new animal species behaviors. But there are also certain disadvantages. So they can be very costly, bulky, consume a lot of power, and leave larger vehicle wakes that can disturb more sensitive parts of the ocean with higher noise signatures. So alongside these vehicles, we can look to nature for inspiration to build bio-inspired underwater vehicles that can then reduce some of these limitations and leave more natural wakes. So these are images of two examples here. On the left is the aqua AUV, and on the right is a soft robotic fish, and they've been used to approach more delicate areas like coral reefs and take images of them. So each choice of model organism for bio-inspired design has its own pros and cons. So I'll explain why we've chosen to use jellyfish for the basis of the biohybrid robot in today's talk. So we're interested in moon jellyfish because despite over 500 million years of evolutionary pressure, their body structure has remained largely unchanged. And these jellyfish, Aurelia arita, have a very simple body structure in which their swimming is intimately tied into behaviors like feeding and escaping and reproducing. They're also ubiquitous and naturally found in a wide range of environments, including different temperatures, salinities, and depths all the way down to the Mariana Trench thousands of meters below the sea surface. And finally, they're invertebrates and they don't possess nociceptors or pain receptors, which then simplifies the ethical considerations. So then in addition to their evolutionary fitness, one potential explanation for their apparent lack of evolution is their energy efficiency. And we can use the cost of transport as one metric of energy efficiency. It's defined as the energy, per mass, per distance traveled, and lower cost of transport values equate to higher energy efficiencies. So this plot shows the cost of transport for a variety of animals, as well as AUVs. And I'd like to point out that these axes are scaled logarithmically. So as shown here, which have the lowest cost of transport compared to other animals and AUVs. So we might be able to study jellyfish swimming in order to potentially apply these, uh, these principles to underwater vehicles. But there are a few different approaches to implementing bio-inspired jellyfish designs. And so at one end of the spectrum is a purely mechanical robot, like RoboJelly shown here, which has very well-controlled inputs and outputs by design. But the main limitation here is that these robots often still require a lot of power. And so you can see in the background, it's still uh, connected to an external power source. 
on the opposite end of the spectrum, as Kit showed in the last talk, is uh, more of a biological construct. So this is the medusoid created from seeding rat cardiomyocytes onto a silicon scaffold. And this is a very successful use of bioengineering and we can use muscles as actuators, as Kit showed. And this is actually, this paper was one of the reasons I decided to work with John DeBerry in my PhD. Um, but the main limitation here, as Kit also explained, is that it can only survive in Tyrodes medium, which is not the same thing as the ocean. So we can't send these constructs out into the ocean to collect data for us at the moment. So the approach that I worked on in my PhD was to create a biohybrid robot by using uh, microelectronics onto a live jellyfish. And so this is a low power and low cost system that is then adaptable to a variety of different environments because that's where these jellyfish exist in the world. But to build a bio-inspired robot, we first need to understand how jellyfish naturally swim, which means that we need to dive into the swim anatomy. So here is a view of the jellyfish from the underside laying in a dish on the left and around the margin in each of these eight circles is a swim pacemaker, which is a sensory organ that innervates the coronal swim muscle. This coronal swim muscle is a ring of muscle that's oriented in a single cell layer on the underside of the animal shown here in red. And it essentially activates in an all or nothing approach, which means that even if only one or a few of the pacemakers fire, it eventually causes the entire muscle ring to activate using a bi-directional wave propagating from those pacemakers. So in order to swim, the jellyfish then activates these pacemakers and the muscles contract during the power stroke and relax during the recovery stroke. But instead of relying on the animal's own natural behavior, we can then use electrodes to act as artificial pacemakers to externally activate the muscles by sending square pulse waves, waves as shown here. We can then create a self-contained swim controller using off-the-shelf microelectronics. So this, this includes a, a plastic housing with a wooden pin that inserts into the animal, a cap for waterproofing, the microcontroller, the battery, and two electrodes. And this is what the system looks like once we put it all together. And you can see that the electrodes have LEDs that flash red as a visual signal that um, the electrical signal is going to the jellyfish. So the swim controller embeds into the jellyfish, jellyfish as shown here. And let me pull up a schematic so that you can see that the animal is in white. The swim controller is in blue. The wooden pin used to embed into the animal is in yellow and the LEDs uh, and electrodes are in red. So this is an example video of the biohybrid robotic jellyfish swimming in a constant flow tank called a pseudocrysal in the lab. You can see that the jellyfish with the swim controller embedded is actually able to swim at a, a faster, more regular pace than the other jellyfish. And there's also a background flow. So you can see that the current is carrying the other more normal jellyfish in the tank. I also just want to point out that the swim controller does not harm the animals. And for more information about that, I've written a paper with some bioethicists at Stanford on the ethical considerations of this work, as well as what this work means for other biohybrid organisms and in a broader context. So the preprint is available at this DOI and QR code. So to determine how externally driving the swimming of fre frequency affects swimming speeds, I then conducted a series of experiments in the lab in a two meter tall tank with the jellyfish starting from the top of the tank and swimming downwards. So from these experiments, we found that we can increase jellyfish swimming speeds up to 2.8 times faster than their baseline speeds. So this plot shows the enhancement factor, which is defined as the stimulated speeds over the unstimulated swimming speeds uh, over the swim controller frequency on the X axis. So we found that the enhancement of swimming speed really depends on the body morphology or the shape of the animal um, as defined by the fineness ratio, which is the bell height over the diameter. So more oblate or flatter animals didn't have much enhanced propulsion, but these more prolate or rounder animals were able to easily double their swimming speeds. So this shows that we can choose more prolate animals for faster control of uh, these animals in future experiments. But um, using this system, we were also able to measure the metabolism in these animals because there's this question of, okay, we can increase jellyfish swimming speeds, but at what cost is this to the actual animal? And to show that, I have this schematic here of uh, an oxygen probe in the water around the jellyfish. 
as well as embedded in the jellyfish tissue itself. And from these experiments, we were then able to uh, collect the oxygen concentration depletion over time and then fold that into the oxygen consumption rate for various fr frequencies as shown in this graph here. And we could take all of these oxygen consumption rates, these different frequencies, to then go back and look at the cost of transport plots that I mentioned earlier. So this plot shows the cost of transport over the swim controller frequency. And you can see that this blue spread is the cost of transport values for this type of jellyfish normally in the literature. And our values at zero hertz, so this unstimulated swimming speed, lie within this range very well. And I just wanna highlight that at this point, we're able to enhance swimming speeds up to almost three times what they would normally do with only a two times increase in the cost of transport. So this suggests that there's a mode for both faster and more energy efficient swimming in jellyfish. And we've uncovered this using our robotic system. This biohybrid robotic jellyfish also can be compared to the external power from other swimming robots. So this plot shows the external power per mass over various swimming speeds for various swimming robots in the literature. Um, and the different marker types show the different types of robots, so more of these biological robots versus the mechanical robots. And the color uh, correlates to the type of propulsion. So there's jellyfish, fish, manta rays, as well as AUVs. And compared to all of these different types of robots, our biohybrid robotic jellyfish exists here. So it uses between 10 to 1,000 times less external power per mass compared to these other robots in the literature. But all of these laboratory experiments were conducted in quiescent and controlled environments. And so if our goal is really to use these biohybrid robots in the ocean, then you know the ocean is definitely not quiescent or controlled. So there's this question of how do these results compare uh, when biohybrid robotic jellyfish are tested in the real world? And so to address this, my collaborators at the Marine Biological Lab and I conducted a series of experiments off the coast of Woods Hole, Massachusetts. So on the left is a map of Massachusetts. And if we zoom in on this, we can see Woods Hole. And if we zoom in, in on Woods Hole, we can then see my collaborators and me. So you can see that they are scientific scuba divers and I am not. So I was on the shore with my box of jellyfish and extra swim controllers in case any of the experiments went wrong and we needed more. So this schematic illustrates the experimental setup off the coast where one scuba diver imaged the jellyfish as it swam upwards at various frequencies. So this is very similar to the laboratory experiments as a fair comparison. In the background is a rope with alternating red and yellow markers so that we could get a ground truth and track the relative position of the jellyfish relative to this background rope. And this is one example run so that you can visualize what the experiments look like. You can see the jellyfish in the foreground swimming upwards with the swim controller embedded. And in the background is that rope with these alternating color markers. And around this biohybrid robotic jellyfish are other wildlife. So you can see fish and potentially other swimming around there. So from these videos, we could then plot the vertical displacements over time to obtain jellyfish swimming speeds for each condition. And then we can calculate the enhancement factors to compare to the previous laboratory data. So this plot shows the previous laboratory data in gray with the different markers representing the six different types of jellyfish in the lab or the individual jellyfish in the lab. So the field data using two animals is shown here in red and blue. And we can see that the enhancement of swimming speeds in coastal conditions is actually pretty comparable with our previous results in the lab. So the absolute swimming speeds increased from approximately two centimeters per second in the baseline control cases, all the way up to 6.6 .6 centimeters per second for jellyfish one at 0.75 Hertz. And I also want to point out that there is high variability at 0.75 Hertz. And this is caused by the presence of the animal's own endogenous contractions because we're not arresting the animal's own behavior. So any frequencies, uh, any swimming frequencies that we're getting from the animal are an overlay of both our electrical signal to the animal as well as whatever it wants to do itself because it's alive. So in addition to the field experiments, we wanted to see whether we could predict jellyfish swimming speeds using a simple hydrodynamic model. Starting from Newton's second law, I modified a mechanistic model that incorporates the body kinematics in thrust, drag, and acceleration reaction forces. And the only inputs here were the animal's geometries, things like the fineness ratio, the bell height, and diameter. 
as well as these time-dependent parameters like the contraction and relaxation times. So using all of these inputs, this plot then shows the theoretical swimming speeds over the experimental vertical swimming speeds tested in the field. So even though this hydrodynamic jetting model neglects paddling behavior, it's still able to predict jellyfish swimming speeds with a mean error of 0.8 centimeters per second. So it's pretty good. Um, so for future robotic control of jellyfish, if we then want to only use faster animals or a large range of swimming speeds, then we can input the animal's morphology and contraction and relaxation times into the model and then predict what swimming speeds we'll get from that animal. So to conclude, robotically controlled jellyfish in coastal conditions can swim up to three times faster than natural jellyfish from approximately two centimeters per second to six centimeters per second with comparable enhancement factors to our previous laboratory results. Despite simplifications to their swimming behavior in a hydrodynamic model, we were able to accurately predict jellyfish swimming speeds using both morphological and time dependent input parameters from the actual animals. And finally, we've shown a proof of concept that biohybrid robotic jellyfish can work reliably well in field conditions. So all of these experiments showed swimming in one direction, but in the future, we can work to improve the maneuverability by incorporating more complicated turning behaviors, using closed loop feedback, adding sensors, and improving the overall robotic design by using biodegradable electronics. So this is all towards the goal that in the near future, we can then deploy these swarms of biohybrid robots to collect ocean data for us. And of course, there are a variety of different approaches to ocean monitoring and bio-inspired designs. So more broadly, I'm interested in uh, looking at other robots as well. And so the last thing that I'll mention before I finish is that I have a methods collection on bio-inspired and biohybrid robots in Jove, the Journal of Visualized Experiments. So I'm a guest editor and uh, you can use the QR code here to visit our webpage and submit an abstract. So I'll put up some instructions here. You can submit a 300 word abstract and then go through this process. And I think it would just be a really great opportunity for people to share their work and to use a more visual medium, which works very well for all of our work today. So with that, I'd like to thank Cabrillo, the Marine Biological Lab, and my collaborators, the Debiri Lab at Stanford and Caltech, and our illustrators and funding sources. If you'd like more information, uh, feel free to see the preprints, and you can contact me here. Thank you for your time and for watching my talk. Thank you so much, Nicole. That's a fantastic uh, presentation. I love seeing biohybrid robots out in the real world. <laughs> uh, nothing makes me happier. Uh, so we do have time for some questions. Um, so I think, uh, Tang, your hand is up. Do you want to go ahead and unmute? Uh, hi, Nicole. Really beautiful talks. So I, I really, it's really in inspiring. And then um, I, I have a couple of questions. First, first thing is like, um, how do you de determine your uh, stimulation parameter, like the frequency that you use, like seem like less than one hertz? Do you try higher than that? Maybe it's, can it increase your, your, your speed? And another one is just, uh, I just noticed in your notice slide that um, you, you haven't got uh, any turning maneuver yet. So how you plan for, for control the turning in uh, the jellyfish? And yeah, so maybe that's all. Yeah, those are great questions. So in the first paper that I published on this work in Science Advances, um, that shows a lot of the different parameters in order to get the stimulation signals. So we tested a range of voltages and figured out that we could use you know, 3.7 uh, and 5 volts pretty well. And those are kind of the, the basic voltages in microcontroller chips that are off the shelf. Um, in terms of the frequency, we tested everything from 0.25 hertz all the way up to, I think the highest I tested was um, 100 hertz. And we, you know, like obviously there's a trade-off in terms of what the, the frequency of the animal can actually do. So the fastest swimming speeds were at 0.5 and 0.62 hertz, just because that gave enough time for the animals to, to pulse as quickly as possible, but then also relax and open up so that the um, underside of the jellyfish bell could refill with water. And so that could uh, cause the most efficient form of swimming. And so to address the second part of your question, which, sorry, could you just repeat that very quickly? I just forgot. 
So I think like the turning maneuver. Yes. Okay. So the, the turning. That? Yeah. Yeah. The turning maneuvers. So instead of stimulating um, using two electrodes that are equally spaced on the bell, we can then look into a different number of electrodes or a different activation pattern. And so that's something something that the next PhD student in John's lab is working on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Um, did you consider using phase response curve analysis to look at the effect of your stimuli on the endogenous rhythm of the, of the uh, animals? We plotted the amplitude spectrum over different frequencies in terms of the, the controls. So when we're not stimulating the animal, as well as when we're embedding the controller with no electrical stimulation. So those are the two controls, as well as all of these different frequencies. But we haven't explored anything beyond that. We were just able to characterize, you know, the, the animals, um, I guess, in the absence of external stimulation, tended to swim at 0.16 hertz with a widespread between 0.4 and 1 hertz. So I'm not sure if that addresses your question, um, but yeah, well, I'd love to hear more. Mm -hmm. Well, it, certainly the effect of the stimulus is going to be depend on where it occurs in the endogenous rhythm of the animal. Mm -hmm. And and if you're close to the endogenous frequency, you're going to entrain it. And if you're way off from the endogenous fr frequency, you're going to perturb it. Uh, yeah. And I'm just wondering when you're away from the endogenous frequency, um, what kind of responses do you see? Yeah, um, so we can get a pretty good input output. So, so again, from that first paper, um, we had the frequency spectrum for lots of different external stimuli. And mm -hmm. at one hertz, for example, which is the, than what the animals typically do, um, we were able to get a really good one-to-one -one correspondence. But when we did approach frequencies that were closer to what the animals naturally did, like 0.25 hertz, then we were still able to get a regular rhythm, but sometimes there would be double or triple pulses. So those are kind of those overlaying effects that I was um, talking about. But I think it would be a good idea to stimulate the animals quite quickly at the beginning so that we would then um, maybe better be able to control their own endogenous pulses and get that uh, kind of in phase with our electrical signals. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask again? Yeah, one, one more question for Volker. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, really excellent talk as well. I'm, I'm yeah, it's really great. So I wonder, uh, rather than stimulating and introducing some steering maneuvers, is there a way of in inhibiting the spread of excitation? So this is uh, probably another alternative uh, for any steering. Yeah. Um, there, I, I tried a few different chemicals that I injected into and around the jellyfish, and that's too slow to actually do anything. And I also tested a range of electrical stimuli, and there was nothing we really did to stop the jellyfish from pulsing, aside from trying to get them to pulse as quickly as possible. Um, so that's something that I think would be better answered by uh, a biology student, a neurobiology student who understands more about the jellyfish um, neuromechanical system and how to perturb it. So that that's a really great question. And I wish that I could have a more satisfying answer to that. Thank you. Um, so we're going to uh, continue on to our next speaker. Uh, and so our next speaker is uh, Professor Dublina Sarkar, who is an assistant professor at MIT and is the AT&T Career Development Chair uh, in the MIT Media Lab. She has the Nano Cybernetic Biotrek Research Group and her group carries out transdisciplinary research fusing engineering, applied physics, biology, uh, aiming to bridge the gap between nanotechnology and synthetic biology to develop disruptive technologies for nanoelectronic devices and create a new paradigm for uh, life machine symbiosis. Uh, she received her undergraduate training at Indian Institute of Technology and then received an MS and PhD in nanoelectronics from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, and thank you so much, Dublina, for being here with us today. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Vicky, for the kind introduction. Um, so hello, everyone. So as Vicky just mentioned, I actually started as an assistant professor just about a year ago. And uh, so I started my career as a nanoelectronics researcher and then did a steep transition uh, to study the brain. So what I will do today is uh, tell you the story of my journey from uh, nanoelectronics to neuroscience. Uh, so let's get started. 
So all of you must have noticed how your laptop heats up uh, when you work for some time and the heat generated is so high that a while ago I even cooked an egg on my laptop. So let us understand where this heat is coming from. So your computer has a billion transistors in them and in those transistors, the electrons need to jump over an energy barrier to cause current flow. And this, when this barrier is high, very few electrons go from source to the drain and your transistor or the electronic switch is off. And when we want to turn on the transistor, what we do is we apply a gate voltage and then we lower the barrier height. So now the electrons can go from the source to the drain and your device or your transistor can turn on. However, this way of uh, <coughs> teaching has a problem. So in an ideal world, you would want that with a very small supply voltage, your device can turn from off to on. However, practically what happens is that you need a finite amount of supply voltage because the transition is not very steep as we would want it to be ideally. But what happens is the current increases gradually as you apply the voltage. That means that you need to apply quite a, a good amount of uh, supply voltage to turn your device on. And that increases the power because the power is uh, kind of the square of the voltage. Now uh, the parameter that describes how steep this transition is from off to on state is called the subthreshold swing of the transistor. And it can be easily defined as the voltage that is required to change the current by a decade or by, change the, by changing the current by 10 folds. And the formula would be subthreshold swing is just the derivative of the gauge voltage that you have to apply by the log of the drain current. So what is actually happening when you want to make the transistors smaller and smaller, because you would want to increase the functionality of your chip by fitting in as many transistors as you can in a given area. But when you make the transistor smaller, what happens is that the electric field from the drain kind of encroaches into the channel and it reduces the barrier height on the source side. So that means that electrons can go from the source to the drain, even when the transistor is supposed to be off. So that would increase the off state current and also degrade the subthreshold swing. So your characteristics becomes less and less steeper. As you can see here, the short channel transistor has much higher off current and basically a degraded steepness. That means again, for achieving the same on to off ratio, you would have to apply higher gate voltage. Or if you keep the gate voltage same, it would lead to higher off current. And again, that means higher power that is required for this transistor to work. Now, a uh, rule of thumb uh, in the world of electronics is that if you can make this channel thinner and thinner, you can also reduce the size of the transistors and still have good electrostatics so that you can overcome this short channel effect. So how thin can we make the channel? We can actually make the channels of the size of few atoms in thickness. And I'm sure most of you would have heard about graphene, but graphene does not have something called a band gap. It is kind of a semi-metal. But to have this barrier for uh, working uh, in a transistor setup, we need semiconductors. So we, we can use beyond graphene 2D semiconductors, which can be atomically thin. And one such material is the transition metal dichalcogenides. And each single layer of this material can be about, uh, you know, in angstrom levels, 0.65 nanometer thick, for example, if we uh, take the example of molybden and disulfide. So by, by using these materials as a channel, we can make the channels atomically thin, thin and then you can overcome uh, this challenge of scaling down of the transistor length. But that is for transistor, you know, scaling down in terms of dimensions, but that does not really completely solve the problem of power supply because here we have also a fundamental challenge 
And that comes from the thermal distribution of electrons in the source that happens. And um, in the transistor, as I said, that we really work by lowering down the barrier height. And this is the energy barrier I'm talking about. And since the electrons in the source, they are distributed according to the Boltzmann distribution, which says that when you go higher in energy, uh, the number of electrons can reduce exponentially. But if in the off state, we have a certain barrier height, say H, and by applying a gate voltage, we reduce it by an amount of say VGS, if VGS is the gate voltage, the current will increase exponentially and it will follow the trend of exponential VGS by KT, where K is the Boltzmann constant and T is the temperature. And if we calculate from there, what it will come out that the subthreshold swing or the steepness of the curve at room temperature is 60 millivolt per decade. That means that if we want to change the current by tenfold, you need to apply at least 60 millivolt of voltage. So that is the ideal case of a conventional you know, transistor where the substitution swing is 60 millivolt. So that means if you want a current on to off ratio of 10,000 or 10 to the power four, you need to apply at least four multiplied by 60, that is 240 millivolts of voltage. You cannot reduce further than that. And that is the best case, the ideal scenario but in a normal case, the substitution swing will be even worse. Your steepness will be worse than that, worse than that. So you would end up having to apply much higher voltage than this. Now, if you really want to solve this problem and you want to really reduce the power and the supply voltage, we would want a substitution swing, which is smaller than 60 millivolt. But we cannot really achieve that by using this conventional way of electrons jumping over the energy barrier for current conduction. So we really need to think of some fundamentally different way of carrier transport. So what if instead of making the electrons jump over the energy barrier, we can make them just tunnel through a barrier like a ghost walking through a wall. So in conventional physics, like we human beings, if there is a wall, we cannot go to the other side of the wall. So while classical physics says that this is not possible, quantum mechanics says it is possible because you know smaller particles, they have uh, wave nature and this wave can penetrate through a barrier. So we can uh, use this property to make uh, novel devices. However, there is a problem. Suppose there is this guy here and uh, like, likes low power and wants to go to the other side of the barrier by just tunneling. But by this time he'll reach the other side of the barrier, he would look something like this. And this is because the electron waves decay exponentially as it passes uh, through an energy barrier. And that means the current that you will get from a device will be extremely low. And sometimes even the noise level, and it's still very difficult to turn on such kind of devices. So if we really want to make a device uh, which uh, takes into, um, you know, takes the advantage of this quantum mechanical tunneling to reduce the power, it requires very intricate device design. So to make the tunneling efficient, we'll have to simultaneously reduce the barrier height as well as the barrier width and make sure there is very high electric field at the tunneling junction to make the tunneling very efficient. So now what I will show you is an example of a tunnel field effect transistor uh, that we had uh, designed and developed, uh, which actually can lead to efficient tunneling and overcome this fundamental limitation of power and lead to substitution swing, which is lower than 60 millivolts per decade. So let me explain how this uh, transistor, uh, which we call the Atlas TIFET, which is the full form for atomically thin and layered semiconducting channel tunnel field effect transistor. So this transistor in here, we still use a 3D material as a source. So the 3D material is used as a source because there we can leverage the mature doping technology of 3D materials 
to create a highly doped source region. So you can make the source almost kind of metallic. So what that leads to is that it leads to very high, um, uh, basically electric field at the tunneling junction, which is required to increase the tunneling probability. And we use a 2D material as a channel. So since the channel is still 2D in nature, which means it's atomically thin, that means we can still leverage the improved electrostatics that this 2D material has to offer. And then we can, uh, that can lead to the reduction and scaling down of um, the transistor size. So that is uh, required if we want to go to sub five nanometer, you know, technology node beyond silicon. And uh, this uh, heterostructure of 3D and 2D material is van der Waals in nature. That means there are no bonds between the 3D and 2D material. So the dopants that you use for the 3D does not diffuse into the 2D material. That is again very important if you want to create a very high electric field at this tunnel injunction. Now the question is which 3D and 2D material to choose? So we want to reduce the height of the energy barrier so we can actually uh, do band gap engineering and choose the 3D and the 2D materials such that the band alignment uh, ensures that the energy gap that we do uh, get in such kind of hydrostructure as is shown by the red dashed lines here uh, can be minimal in nature. So in our case, we chose germanium and uh, germanium as a 3D material source and molybdenum disulfide as a 2D material such that uh, the band alignment leads to about 0.3, 0 0.4 EV of um, barrier height. And uh, apart from reducing the barrier height, we have to reduce the barrier width, but at the same time, we have to turn the transistor off and on as well. So we cannot have Basically, you need a tunable, tunable barrier so that we can tune the barrier to be large to have an off state and lower when, to, when you want to turn it on. And this basically shows the energy landscape of this heterostructure, basically from this 3D germanium through the molybdenum disulfide through a gate dielectric layer to the gate. And to explain it uh, very simply uh, for folks who might not be, um, you know, experts in this field. So um, here, what is shown is the green, re uh, the colored regions here are basically the regions where the electrons can stay. And whatever you see in white are called the forbidden gap. So the electrons are not energetically favorable to stay in this regions, the white regions. Uh, so what happens is that in the off state, we have to align the bands such that the field regions um, in the source, that is the region in energy, which are um, filled with electrons, they do not align with the empty regions in the channel, as you can see by the black arrow here. So there, the current is very low. But when we want to turn on the device, we apply a gate voltage and we lower down the bands so in this case, the region in the source, which has a lot of electrons, didn't align with the region in the channel, which are empty. So that leads to a high flow in current, as you can see by this uh, green. So that turns the device on, and that is controllable by the gate. And as you can see that uh, the, the thickness of the barrier here is basically this two layers of molybdenum disulfide that we have used here. And each layer is only three atoms thick. So the tunneling barrier width we have got is only six atoms in thickness. So that leads to very high you know, uh, tunneling current compared to a conventional device. But this shows a TEM image of a structure. This is basically germanium and two layers of molybdenum disulfide. But what to see is that apart from the germanium and the molybdenum disulfide, there is also a layer of germanium oxide. So that is not good because that will increase uh, the tunneling barrier. So that's a challenge, but that's also an advantage because in uh, the future devices, we can actually passivate the germanium and get rid of the oxide and can increase the tunneling current even further. So this shows the subthreshold characteristics of our device, the subthreshold swing. And you can see that while for a conventional transistor, 
the subtracial swing is always above this 60 millivolt line, but our atlas defect actually overcomes uh, this fundamental limitation and uh, leads to a much lower uh, subtracial swing, the lowest of which is around 3.9 millivolt per decade, but the average is about uh, 31 millivolt per decade, which is uh, uh, almost half of uh, what the fundamental limit is. So by lowering the subtracial swing, that means that we can lower the supply voltage and the supply voltage, the power being, you know, as the square of the voltage, we can get more than 75% reduction in power with this device. And as I mentioned, apart from power reduction, because this is made up of only six atoms thick uh, channel, it can also lead to um, um, like reduction in scale and scalability of device size. So we can go to beyond silicon uh, scalability era with this kind of uh, transistors. So, uh, you know, while working on low power electronic devices uh, for electronic computations, I also got interested in other, um, other non-electronic computational system, specifically the brain, because the brain probably can be thought of as the lowest power computer ever. The human brain, which, is, which weighs just three pounds, uh, but uh, it's uh, really the brain which, uh, you know, makes us uh, uh, so unique and different from other animals. And if we peep inside the brain, we'll see that it's formed of you know, billions of computational elements neurons, and which talk to each other uh, using chemical and electrical signals. So the brain does all these computations, but consumes only about 20 watts of power, which is similar to a mere uh, light bulb. However, at present, you understand very less as to how the brain works. So why is it so difficult to understand the brain? So if we think of an electronic circuit, we know all the components, uh, individual components, and also we know how they are connected to each other. We know the physics of, say, semiconductors, dielectrics, um, uh, metals, and we can draw band diagrams to understand the working principle. However, in the brain, we not only know how the individual components like the neurons are connected to each other, but we also do not know the biomolecular composure of uh, the neurons and how you know, the, um, the neural codes of computation is unknown. And if we look into a small region of the brain and do you zoom in, we'll see that it's formed of a dense jungle of biomolecules, which will probably look very similar to the gum wall in Seattle. So how do we really decipher uh, this uh, biomolecular um, composer and architecture of the brain to get a better understanding of uh, you know, how the brain works? So uh, most current technologies um, uh, that are, you know, we need some super resolution technology to zoom into the brain, but present technologies, um, super resolution technologies are either very expensive or require expert handling and cannot do a whole brain imaging at the same time. So in this respect, the technology called expansion microscopy is uh, very interesting. And the idea here is that instead of using complicated hardware to see small features in the sample, uh, why not expand the sample itself? So there are two points uh, which are very close together and a conventional diffraction limited microscope cannot disturb them and resolve them. Uh, by physically expanding the sample itself, we can actually separate these two points in space then even using the same diffraction limited microscope without changing the hardware, we can actually resolve those two points. And so how do we actually expand you know, physical samples? And we can use um, hydrogels and hydrogels are materials which will swell up and expand when you add water. And so simply if we take a piece of brain tissue, we embed in hydrogel and polyacrylate gel is one example of the hydrogel. And if we add water, we'll see that this brain tissue, this expands. And, uh, you know, and the points on bile molecules are separated from each other in space. And what I'm showing here is actually the same piece of brain tissue. The left one is before expansion, and this is about um, after about fourfold expansion. And uh, so if we think of uh, resolution as uh, the diffraction limit uh, by the expansion factor, and uh, if we take the diffraction limit as about 300 nanometer, 
by about four to 4.5 fold expansion, we can get a resolution of about 70 nanometer from using the same hardware, exact same hard hardware and exact same microscope. So we can actually overcome the diffraction limit of the microscope by physically expanding the sample. So to give you a little bit, um, uh, you know, tell you a little bit more about how this works. So we start with a fixed specimen, biological specimen, and then we anchor the biomolecules of interest. Suppose in our case, this is some membrane proteins or lipids that you are in, interested in. We'll anchor them so that they can get attached to the hydrogel. And then we form this uh, swellable gelling network. And then we'll have to do some processing so that we can get rid of the mechanical tension in the tissue. And after that, we add water. As you can see here, the polymer expands and the biomolecules expands and separates from each other as the gel expands and then they can be separated in space and that leads to resolving these biomolecules. So apart from just doing one round of expansion, since expansion factor, if we increase expansion factor or resolution improves, so we can do this step iteratively, which means that after first round of expansion, we can embed the, um, uh, uh, that expanded gel again in another polymer, polymer network and expand it again so that by doing this process iteratively, we can increase the expansion factor. But in this first round of technology that we call the iterative expansion microscopy, IEXM, we actually had to discard the original biomolecules because transferring the biomolecules from one gel to another was difficult. And instead, what we had to use are these uh, DNA proxies. And as DNAs were used as proxies to hold the location information of the biomolecules. So this, of course, had some obvious challenges because uh, we cannot do any post-processing of the biomolecules because the biomolecules were lost. There was an inherent error, uh, and this inherent error is um, basically common to all, uh, all super-resolution technologies because you always have to use some antibodies. And the size of the antibodies is uh, around, say, 15 to 30 nanometer. So that means that we have this inherent uh, error in resolution of that much. Uh, when, uh, so we cannot go beyond in um, beyond 30 nanometers. And of course, we cannot use conventional antibodies. We had to use DNA conjugated antibodies. And also this technology um, yeah, was um, not suitable for working with RNA. It was only good for proteins. Uh, to overcome these challenges, we developed a technology called expansion revealing recent, recently. We call it revealing. Not previously, uh, you know, visualized with other technologies. So some of so the advantages of this technology is that we were able to retain the biomolecules we could use off the shelf antibodies. So, and also because we were, we could bring in um, the antibodies after the whole expansion process. I could do post-processing as the biomolecules were retained. The effective size of the antibodies could be reduced uh, by, uh, this, by the expansion factor. If we could do 20-fold expansion uh, and the size of primary and secondary antibodies together was 30 nanometer, the effective size of the antibodies became 30 divided by 20 around 1.5. Uh, so that means that, you know, if we can go on increasing the expansion factor, the error is as low as 1.5 nanometer. And uh, another advantage of this technology is uh, the decrowding effects. If there is a biomolecule and you're trying to stain that biomolecule, but in the tissue, we have a very crowded environment. This antibody, which is uh, quite sizable in nature, it does not have access uh, to this biomolecule. However, when we do the expansion, all the surrounding biomolecules are decrowded and expanded. So now the antibody can access the target biomolecule of interest. 
And so that is why we were actually able to uh, visualize structures um, by because of the decrowding effects, which could not be seen with other super resolution technologies. So we were actually able to discover some uh, invisible structures in the brain. And that is why we named our technology um, expansion revealing. And I will show some examples um, uh, later on. And uh, apart from proteins, this is also actually um, suitable for um, seeing nanoscale structures of RNA, lipids, and uh, different types of biomolecules. So we characterized our uh, technology by looking at microtubules. So microtubules are actually hollow structures on which these motor proteins walk, and they have um, a diameter about 20 to 25 nanometer. We found that we can actually resolve uh, these hollow structures uh, with this technology. So our resolution is uh, around you know, 20 nanometer after uh, around 20 fold expansion. And uh, we wanted to look at synaptic structures using this technology. And, um, um, and uh, as you can see here, the left image here is uh, the image of a synapse without uh, EXR and the right one is the image of a synapse after you apply this EXR technology. So as you can see, while we cannot resolve the synapse in using a conventional diffraction limited microscope, but after the EXR is done, this can actually be resolved and uh, we can clearly see two different protein structures. Here, uh, Bassoon is in green and PSD95 is in red here. So these are actually um, protein structures, presynaptic and postsynaptic uh, proteins that you can clearly resolve. So we wanted to see if we can uh, really, you know, uh, answer some biological questions uh, using this technology. And you're talking about, you know, living systems here. And I found I thought my talk was kind of a little bit off from the main theme. Uh, but, um, you know, if we can think of uh, robotics, you can think of these neurotransmitters that are, you know, transmitted in the brain and goes from one neuron to the to another, and uh, their transport. You know how um, how these neuro how these neurotransmitters are moving from one neuron to another actually depends on the biomolecular organization of the synapses. But by imaging, uh, you know, uh, this kind of um, uh, in, uh, this uh, brain tissue with this kind of super resolution technologies, we can actually get uh, information about uh, the living systems. So in our um, uh, in our work, we uh, tried to look at these three proteins, uh, which is RIM, PSG95, and calcium channel. So RIM is actually the protein which tells us the point at which these neurotransmitters are going to be released from one of the neurons. So PSG95 acts as a scaffold uh, for receptor molecules. So the receptor molecules actually, uh, 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 they, when the neurotransmitters come in, they, uh, they get attached to these receptors. And uh, then those receptors molecules can act on based on this attachment and they can open up and let in the flow of other ions. And so that is basically a way one neuron will communicate with another neuron in a synapse. And uh, when you image um, uh, these uh, proteins, um, and as you can see here is an expanded uh, view of the synapse, we found some very interesting characteristics and we found that these uh, molecules are actually not just uniformly randomly distributed, but they form some uh, very well-defined nanoclusters. And what is even more interesting is that nanoclusters of one protein, they align very well uh, with the centers of nanoclusters of the other protein. Now, remember these two are actually in two different neurons but there seems to be a nanoscale alignment going on uh, between the biomolecules in completely uh, different neurons. And um, we did some analy analysis and we found that this nanocluster size is actually you know, a few tens of nanometers. And the precision of alignment is in nanoscale. It's not micron scale, it's nanoscale, which is amazing. And uh, the reasoning behind um, uh, this is the follow is the following. As I mentioned, that RIM is the protein which dictates where the neurotransmitter are going to be released, and uh, basically the PSG95 is as uses 
is used as a scaffold for the receptors. So the fact that these rim molecules are you know, clustered uh, directly above the point where the receptors are clustered, that ensures that these neurotransmitters have to uh, you know, travel to the lowest possible distance. Because if these receptors were just clustered everywhere, they had to travel you know, larger distances to reach the other neurons. So by nanoscale alignment of uh, biomolecules, Mother Nature had made sure that the uh, efficacy of uh, this neurotrans neurotransmitter uh, transport is uh, you know, maximized and that actually improves uh, the efficiency of our neural uh, transmission. And, um, and uh, then basically that leads to the efficacy of uh, neuronal information processing in the brain. So, um, so I showed an example in the beginning that how in a transistor we were using, you know, uh, uh, these atomically thin materials to reduce our barrier height. But it's amazing when we see that in our brain, Mother Nature has done this kind of nano architecture to increase the efficacy of uh, tunneling of neurotransmitters. So. Um, we are also applying this to different kind of uh, neurological diseases. And uh, to quickly uh, tell you, I said that we can reveal structures which are not otherwise available to see with other technologies. We saw that in case of Alzheimer's disease, we find um, some uh, very interesting pattern, periodic structures of biomolecules, as you can see here, which are not actually visualized before you do the expansion at the same level of resolution. And you can actually do up to 100-fold uh, expansion with this technology, uh, so you can improve the resolution further. Uh, just to quickly summarize, then I showed you, you know, two different technologies. One is a transistor for overcoming fundamental limitations in power. And there is a technology which helps us to look at, um, um, you know, the biomolecular building blocks of the brain and give an example of a transsynaptic architecture. And also talked about the synergies, you know, between these uh, two different systems. In our own lab, we are actually uh, trying to um, basically fuse these two technologies together and develop novel nanoelectronics biohybrids uh, for life machine synergism. We're developing nanoelectronics, which are the size of the cells, and, uh, you know, we're developing nano implants, which can do energy harvesting for wireless sensing for both re reading in information from the brain as well as writing in information. And we continue to push forward the boundaries of um, an energy efficient nanoelectronics as well. So we have a lot of um, openings in our group for uh, graduate students and postdocs. Uh, so, you know, if you are interested, you can see the information in this page. Uh, so I think I will end my talk here. I think I have gone over my time. So I'll take any questions if there's still some time left. Thank you so much for the, the fascinating talk. I, I I love the the idea you share at the end that you know there's almost this we are the biohybrid in the future, right? With this embedded electronics in, in the human brain. Um, so we, we have run into break a little bit, uh, but you know, so if people need to go take a break, feel free to take a break. Uh, Devlina, if you're willing to stick around for a question or two, I can open it up for questions um, if anyone has any questions they want to ask. I guess I can I can throw one out there. Um, so with the with these cell scale electronics, that is this goal that you're talking about. Um, do you see that as um, trying to interface with the cellular systems and kind of control cellular processes, or do you see that more as a sensor platform? Oh, actually, we are doing both. And one of the technologies we are developing is um, for sensing the cellular electrical signals. And uh, the other one is to modulate the cells, you know, so, so that you can therapeutically stimulate the cells. 
but at a single cell resolution. And since these are wireless non-electronic devices, they can be distributed. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 we don't have to say have a large electrode where multiplexing is so difficult. So you can do multiplexing recording from multiple regions of the brain um, at the same time. And this would be like minimal invasive in nature as well. Um, well, if folks have other questions, please feel free to use the Discord um, or throw them in chat. I'm going to go ahead and throw the schedule slide back on this. Speaker, can I? Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, so let's move on to the next speaker. The next, next speaker is a Professor Barbakam. Okay. So is an expert in micro nanoscale systems engineering with a focus on biomedical applications. She's an associate professor and John R. Jones uh, three faculty fellow at uh, Virginia Tech where she runs the micro nanoscale biotech, uh, abiotic system uh, engineering laboratory. She received the, her BS in mechanical engineering from the Sharif University of Technology, as well as an MS and a PhD in mechanical engineering from the Carnegie Mellon University. The, her research interest, her research interest includes uh, biohybrid micro, micro robotic systems for cancer therapy, interfacial mechanics of the pathogen biomaterial uh, interactions, the mechanobiology of microbial infection, and mammalian cells migration in multi-queue environment. Okay, so the, please begin uh, your presentation. Uh, hi, Masahiro. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you to we, you and uh, Vicky for the invitation. And um, a good afternoon to all from Virginia. Wherever you are, it might be in the middle of the night, but it's a beautiful afternoon here. And it's my pleasure to share with you the work that my lab does on engineering bacteria-based biohybrid swarms. Um, so let me begin mentioning that we are changing the scale quite a bit here. We have heard many beautiful talks uh, this morning and just right now before me uh, on using cells, mammalian cells, as for biohybrids. And these uh, cells are typically about 100 micron in, di in uh, dimension when they're stretched out. And that puts these biohybrid systems in the range of millimeter to perhaps centimeter. Um, our interest is in developing biohybrid micro robots uh, where we use bacterial cells that are about two micron uh, in length. Uh, and we interface these with nanoscale uh, abiotic or synthetic components. So what you see here is sort of our platform in the lab, which, which we call NanoBeads. So you will hear me say NanoBeads a lot throughout the presentation. It's a nice short way of referring to these uh, bacteria nanoparticle assemblies. Uh, the bacteria is what uh, gives our system a robotic flavor. They have actuators, sensors, and they are capable of communication and we can use methods in synthetic biology to control their communication and their actuation and sensing. I'll talk about that more during the presentation. The reason that we developed interest in using bacteria and developing biohybrids is that they are very resilient and um, amenable to function in a variety of ways. They can take um, a variety of carbon sources as a source of energy and produce self-propulsion in a number of environments from aqs based environment that we have been seeing a lot today to um, uh, self-propulsion in mucus or inside human tissue. And uh, as Masahiro mentioned, we have uh, interest in developing biomedical devices. So having the ability to self-propel interstitially is very um, attractive for us. Um, these systems can also be engineered to be very selective to the target location, say a particular tissue within human body. And we can also engineer them, as I mentioned before, for communication and cooperative task completion. Um, there are a few challenges in these systems that we are currently focused on. Um, manufacturing uh, and control are two of them. We are also interested in intravascular and interstitial control, but given the limited time that we have today, I'm just going to focus on manufacturing and control aspects. 
Um, when it comes to control, especially, I think it's important to discuss it in context of application. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you what motivates the development of nanobeads up front, and then I'll go through the challenges that we are trying to address. We are motivated by the challenge that exists in delivery of drugs to cancer. Cancer therapy is a really complex field with many challenges that are not necessarily all transport related, but transport is a big one where um, there are two levels of transport challenges, one intravascularly, which I'm not going to focus on today. The other is interstitially, meaning even if you get the drug of interest to the cancerous tissue, the next layer of challenge is to get the drug out of the blood vessel and into the tissue. And as you see in these two images shown here, um, the left hand side image with the blood vessels showing in pink, the drug only diffuses out a very small distance from the blood vessel. Uh, you see the same here with the colors flipped where the vessels are purple and the drug is in red. And all the black and green tissue that you see here and here, it's cancer that is not treated. So our idea was to use bacteria and their innate ability to self-propelling tissue to carry the um, uh, therapeutics deeper into the tissue, but we wanted to use bacteria for more than just passive de delivery agents. We wanted to program them so they can do so effectively and safely. So let me begin with the manufacturing challenge for developing nanobeads for cancer therapy. Um, we would like to make these systems uh, as uh, in a scalable and repeatable manner. That's the challenge with all the biohybrids as we have heard earlier today. Um, what we do is to use a variety of methods, I'm showing an example here, to functionalize the surface of bacteria and also functionalize the surface of the nano load of interest, and then use self-assembly to combine the bacteria and the nano load. Given that it's a self-assembly process, uh, there is going to be a distribution in the number of nanoparticles that adhere to the bacteria, but we have identified the process parameters that would impact the outcome, specifically the number of nanoparticles that attach to bacteria. And even though we still have a distribution, not a unique number for the load, but this distribution, as you see from the arrow bars, is highly repeatable with an average of 22 nanoparticles per uh, bacterium. And we are able to produce billions of these in a matter of hour or two. Um, we are working on improving this further. We have a newer method in the publication pipeline where this distribution is significantly more narrowed. But even in its current form, having this distribution, we are able to calculate the amount of nano load that they are carrying. And as a result, say for the drug delivery application, what is the concentration of drug that they are carrying? So with the manufacturing um, issue somewhat under control, meaning be able to develop scalable and repeatable nanobead uh, system or population, we next turned our attention to performance of these systems. And we would like for this performance to be predictable. This is particularly important if you're thinking biomedical application and safe operation in vivo. And um, to achieve this predictable performance, as I said, would be quite important. It would also be important for these systems to have uh, some level of autonomy where they can uh, process the, inf the information in their local environment and make decisions, decentralized decision conditions that they sense so they can operate differently based on the environment that they are located in. Um, so going back to our um, motivation that I mentioned before, if these nanoparticles are only um, penetrating into the cancerous tissue for a limited distance from the blood vessel, with bacteria, we are able to pull them further in to do so in a controlled manner, not just passively. Um, before I go tell you about the controlled manner of transporting the drug load, uh, I'd like to show you our area where we wanted to test our hypothesis and demonstrate that bacteria are indeed enhanced retention and distribution of uh, nanoparticles or nanomedicine within the uh, cancer environment. For this, we utilized a mouse model of breast cancer. We introduced nanoparticle as sort of our baseline control and our nanobeads or bacteria nanoparticle assemblies as our system of interest. Um, we conducted the experiment, excised the tumor, and a very talented student, um, former PhD student, Chris Su, he um, 
excised all the tumors, sliced them, and painstakingly imaged these millimeter-sized tumor at high magnification under a confocal microscope to identify the distribution of nanoparticle in the tumor and compared it to the distribution of nanobeads. And as you can see, we have five times more nanobeads distributed within the tumor tissue. But remember, each nanobead has 20 nanoparticle or 22 nanoparticles on average attached to its surface. So in effect, we have enhanced the um, distribution of the nanoparticles within the tumor tissue by a factor of 100, 100 times. And we have done so without causing any toxicity uh, in vivo. So as you see here from um, so a, a sample of our uh, toxicity assay, the liver and spleen tissue of the mouse that was treated with nano beads has no difference from the liver and spleen of the mouse that was tr treated with PBS, which is our control case. In addition to showing that um, our uh, nanobeads are effective in retention and distribution um, of the nanoparticle load, another finding from our in vivo experiment was the fact that um, we saw a lot more nanobeads in the tumor tissue compared to liver and spleen. So we had about a thousand times more nanobead in the tumor tissue than liver, and about 10,000 times more nanobeads in the tumor tissue compared to spleen. So we decided to use this preferential colonization as a cue for controlling the nanobeads behavior. And uh, for this, we were inspired by um, another behavior of bacteria known as quorum sensing, which is a number density dependent regulation of gene expression. So a method of cooperation between the bacteria that is regulated by the number of bacteria that are present in a particular domain. So I let this video play a few times, but what you are seeing here at the beginning there, the background is dark, is low number of bacteria where they are monitoring their number density using a small diffusible chemical signals. And they understand that their number is low so they don't uh, express green fluorescent protein as they grow and their number increases past a certain threshold uh, number density, you can see that they light up. So we use the GFP expression as the output for developing mathematical models that will then allow us to uh, sort of have a model that describes the behavior of the swarm in order to achieve our goal, which remember it was achieving robust and tunable performance from our nanobead swarm. So we conducted methods from synthetic biology that allows us to construct a quorum sensing sense, uh, circuit with tunable uh, um, sort of behavior or performance, and then combine that with uh, our mathematical knowledge and background from robotics and dynamic systems in order to have a model that describes this um, behavior of uh, quorum sensing, which in essence is decentralized control, right? Each bacterium monitors how many other bacteria are around it and makes a decision to light up based on, based on that information. Before our attempt at developing this decentralized control, um, my lab down here, part of my PhD up here, and other labs have done great work in um, developing uh, quite elegant models for centralized control. I have put older papers here for the benefit of um, younger researchers uh, in the audience. If you'd like to see how the field began in the bacteria domain, these were the earliest papers where uh, any signal that you see introduced here, it's a global signal that all the biohybrids sense and respond to. Uh, we wanted to achieve a more decentralized approach, hence the quorum sensing based approach that I mentioned on the previous slide. And um, in order to design the system to have the quorum sensing behavior or cooperative task completion based on the number density, we need to have a model, right? We need to be able to quantitatively describe or predict when the system will be activated based on the initial condition of the system and the initial and boundary condition of the environment. So we went ahead and developed a multi-scale model that relates the signal level uh, information so that is the quorum sensing signal, the, the small chemical diffusible signal that bacteria produce to the swarm dynamics. So going across this scale of molecular to um, multicellular, um, we described all the relevant uh, phenomena from growth to diffusion, to motility, uh, to physical interaction and uh, sort of collision between the organisms and the organism and the environment. 
We don't have time to go through the detail of the model. If you're interested, you will see a series of references at the bottom of the slide. But what I would like to show you is sort of the, the output of that model, um, where as you see here, hopefully we can, yes, we can get this video to play. Um, in this particular demonstration of the match between the model and experiment, we have bacteria that are uh, performing chemotaxis moving to the left-hand side of the domain. And then as they move, they also secrete the quorum sensing signal that you see in the rainbow colors uh, down below in our model. And um, if you pay attention to the timestamp on the two uh, videos, you see that when you see green fluorescent signal or bacteria lighting up in the experiment as a result of quorum sensing, at a similar time frame, these black dots that represent bacteria turn green. So we were able to quantify quorum sensing activation uh, with less than 7% error under a variety of condition um, where we basically have this experimentally validated computational model that describes quorum sensing as well as other aspects of swarm dynamics. So having this model, then we started exploring the robustness of the cooperative behavior using quorum sensing. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of examples just to um, bring the point home in uh, computational modeling being a really important tool in streamlining development of biohybrid swarms. Uh, biology is too complex, and we discussed the stochasticity earlier today when Professor Parker gave his keynote talk. Um, not everything can be necessarily put into a model, but we can achieve a much more streamlined experimental effort uh, if we have a model that kind of narrows our design space. So that's the that's the attempt that I'm going to try communicating over the next couple of slides as I wrap up here. Um, so we first looked at the effect of environmental cue. What you see in these slides is the same number of bacteria at the beginning, the same quorum sensing circuit design. What is different is different environmental condition that would cause the bacteria to organize themselves differently. And as you see in the first case where bacteria are homogeneously distributed, they will never quorum sense. In the second case, it takes almost twice as long as the third case to achieve quorum sensing. This information is important for in vivo application if you're thinking about growth, if you're thinking about immune response, to be able to know what you, you should expect, what kind of organization, what kind of numbers you end up with, and what kind of time window ha you have in order to achieve the function of interest before you miss your window. So taking this and kind of zooming out further, broadly speaking, this cooperative function is going to depend not only on the initial population size that I showed you when I introduced the concept of quorum sensing, it is also going to depend on environmental conditions such as transport and sort of removal of the signal from the environment, other environmental conditions that might dictate how the bacteria organize themselves, the growth rate, and finally the circuit that you design, how sensitive you make that circuit be. So taking all these parameters, we can look at things like the examples of the design space that you see down below, where on the y-axis we have the spatial organization, metric and on the x-axis the sensitivity of the genetic circuit and the three plots are showing what the outcome will be, how long it will take to have quorum sensing as a function of the growth rate. And then you can look at this and decide you know, what is acceptable, what is favorable, and then pull that out as the design parameters that you are going to use. We can also look at robustness of this activation by looking at the standard deviation in the response that comes from the stochasticity of the system and avoid the designs that are too, uh, that the standard deviation is too large. Okay, there is sort of a wide range of possibilities for what kind of activation time you might experience. So bringing this home and going back to what I said at the beginning in terms of uh, preferential colonization in the tumor compared to other tissue, we can use this information to kind of nucleate some bacteria at a location and some other bacteria at another location. These, you see the scale is in millimeter scale. So this could be healthy tissue with less number of bacteria compared to nearby cancerous tissue with much more bacteria. Or we could look at situation where the tumor is not going to be homogeneously colonized by bacteria. We could have focal colonization. And we can use our model to make sure that in this case, we will not have activation from this small number of bacteria in the healthy tissue. So bacteria sense their local environment and make the decision 
not to activate. Whereas in these two cases where you have this focal colonization in the tumor, you will still get activation and as a result, a robust response within your tumor environment. Um, so hopefully in this limited amount of time that we had, I was able to communicate to you the value of developing biohybrid microrobotic systems uh, at the micro scale. So just a couple of microns. Uh, I think they are particularly beneficial for biomedical applications. And hopefully you also got a glimpse of what are the current challenges in manufacturing and control of these systems, the, the bacterial biohybrid systems and our attempt at addressing these challenges. Uh, with that, I would like to thank the group and the funding sources, and also, of course, the collaborators, the names that you see highlighted in bold font are the people that contributed to this particular project that I presented. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I would be happy to take any question you might have. Okay, thank you very much for your great uh, talk. So, uh, actually, we, we are a little bit uh, behind the schedule, but uh, we can ask one or two, uh, we, we can accept one or two uh, questions. So, is there any question or comment? Okay, so the from me, now, I have a question about uh, strong dynamics of your model. So the, how, ex, how extent does the hydrodynamic interaction affect between the bacteria in your swarm dynamics? Uh, that's an excellent question. So there is certainly hydrodynamic interaction between the bacteria. It's a function of the number of bacteria that are present in the environment. If, it's, if the environment in an aqueous environment, if more than 10% of the volume is occupied mm -hmm. by bacteria, we expect them to interact with one another. Currently, the way that it's implemented in the model for it to be computationally efficient is using an empirical function that accounts for what kind of change in angle we expect after collision and what kind of change in velocity we expect based on the separation distance between the bacteria. Uh, but there are many more elegant models there from people who do work in bacterial hydrodynamics, um, which you know go into this in much more depth. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the so for for other questions, if you have a question, the please uh, write uh, into the Discord, please. So. Uh, Uh, is it fine, Masahiro? It's, uh, can you see well the screen? Yes, yes. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for your nice introduction. And uh, well, um, as as uh, as uh, it has already been <laughs> explained a little bit, uh, my current work is more focused on the development of biohybrid robots, and, and I'm here today to explain to you a little bit about the research that we are currently doing at the Institute of Bioengineering of Catalonia uh, at the Smart Nano Devices Group led by uh, Samuel Sanchez, bo both uh, working in nanomotors and in, let's say, in biohybrid robots, 3D printed biohybrid robots. So what I will explain to you more today, it's not uh, so much about the swarming of active nanomotors, but more on how we create 3D structures which are living actuators of great interest for uh, robotic systems. Uh, in that sense, uh, I, I just want to do or to give a glimpse of the main um, like uh, characteristics that we are aiming for. We've already seen excellent talks today about how uh, such uh, active or like biological machines or active elements are integrated in robotic systems, generally being compliant uh, polymeric systems that can be in 2D. So to say like some um, like uh, thin films uh, as we've seen with, uh, with Ray or uh, with uh, some of the other uh, robots that have been presented today. Uh, but also I would like to remark uh, how important it is to to also uh, exploit the adaptability of such systems of uh, that that it allows us to train them. So when we design a robot, we don't have it with its just with its initial properties, but we are able to actually perform certain trainings 
in, in our special case, it had been some controlled electrical stimulation protocols to get uh, an enhanced force output uh, to, to because they are able to adapt to their uh, external conditions, like to, to what's been imposed in their environment, but also uh, how they can self-heal, which is something that it's it's barely found or it is really uh, underdeveloped in the, in, in the artificial robotic systems, even in, in the soft robotics area, right? So what we are looking for in, in our case, it's more on how to exploit and to integrate such a skeletal muscle uh, cells into, into some compliance systems where we are mimicking the conditions of the native tissues. As we see in, in depicted in this image, this hierarchical organization is pretty complex. So what we want to do is to find an actuation as closer as the one that we see in our body. And for that, generally it requires to have a constant stress that uh, like uh, it helps to have a dynamic structure which is adapting to it. For that, I just want to give an overview of how we at least envision the development of cell robots. We think that is key to rely uh, on not only on engineering of the design of these robots, but also on the emergence on terms of self-organization of cell robots and also on the emergence of certain functionalities that it's inherent uh, living uh, systems, right? So to do that, the first step is to understand how it is the interaction between these cells, between them, uh, sorry, between the cells, the immediate environment, and then how this overall biological system works. So once this is understood, then we can exploit different disciplines ranging from synthetic biology to tissue engineering on all what it matters in terms of uh, material science and also how to construct and how to exploit the, the advanced technologies that we have nowadays in our labs to create uh, complex systems. And, and for that is when we have to engineering, to do engineering design and to use such advanced manufacturing. And these generally results or we can more or less like, uh, like uh, let's say, classifying three different uh, main systems that could be the, um, the organoids, sorry, the organoids, and then we have the biological machines or the microphysiological systems that you can see here. So um, in, uh, in the next slide, I want to show you a little bit the skeletal muscle based systems. I have to say that I had uh, the cardiac based um, living robots, but I, I totally took them out after the, the fantastic talk from Professor Parker. And here I want just to, to show you a little bit how uh, two key systems that inspired us on, to, on design our biohybrid robot, right? One of them is this cell-laden ring. So that the, what's actuating and responding to the electrical stimulation is actually this, this ring, which is loaded with uh, a skeletal muscle cells, which is in two legs, uh, the system, which are intentionally asymmetric to have a different friction when there is this motion and that results in an efficient motion. And the next one, it is the only reported swimming robot before the one we developed, which was uh, especially beautiful, I would say, because uh, it didn't only include the skeletal muscle uh, cells in, in the structure in order to have this, this bending or let's say uh, to, to, to have this impulse of the robot, but the actuation, the, the, like the on-off and how it was actuated, it was through uh, optic optogenetically modified neurons. And, and that was really um, amazing in terms of control and the capability that it can show in the future. I didn't want us to rely on that and also for the sake of time, I wanted to explain to you a little bit about another kind of roads, which I think I, they are gonna be key in the next years, which is what if we will have any artificial element. So if we have just have like these biological machines per se without uh, any, any skeleton or without any thin layer which is holding and guiding somehow their actuation. So this is one of the few examples that we can find. Uh, they are the Xenobots and they are based on frog cells. They say, we can say that there are two different generations, but it's really nice that in their But uh, I have to say that the video down there is more from their second generation of the Xenobots, which is based on robots, which they already have some psyllium. So they are moving uh, much better. 
And uh, and as I'm saying, like, okay, we are working with advanced technologies. Uh, which ones? Indeed, we focus our attention in, in the use of additive manufacturing. And for that, we are developing our own inks. Uh, it's true that for PDMS, we are using the commercially available one. But uh, in terms of bio inks, we, we actually... Um, uh, so we, we we optimize the process of happening, which is biocompatible and which in which the cells are feeling really comfortable. Like uh, it's not about the fact of constructing 3D systems, which is one of the advantages of working in with the skeletal muscle cells, right? Which they grow well in 3D structures, and therefore we can have these actuators having much complex uh, conformations of shapes. It's also about the fact that when you are extruding them, the same force or the same stress that, uh, that they undergo when they are printing, it aligns them. And this is especially key to obtain a better alignment on the fibers. So as I showed you before, there is this this very, I wouldn't say very complex, but it is uh, organization of the of the fibers in the native muscle that we wanted to 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 copy somehow. So in that case, it's not only about creating these fibers one onto the other on a certain organization, but also to have the cells really well aligned. And when you do that, you actually have a really good bending. Question is how we evaluate such bending. In the group, we developed uh, this technology that it was actually uh, presented here uh, by Rafael Mestre. It's these two posts. It's not something that it's uh, really uh, unique from us, but we have to say that we, we use this platform for several um, uses uh, as microphysiological systems. And when I'm saying that Rafa presented that before, it was especially this part that I told you uh, before that we can train the muscle to be stronger. And that was that study was performed precisely in these two post systems that they were bending. And you could modulate how to do this training in terms of frequency, but also on how this uh, material where the cells were in contact, it's affecting this maturation process. And for that, we were able to get the better actuator. But the question is like, for what this could be useful for a from uh, biohybrid robots that I will really surely get there. Uh, that was used as, um, as a drug testing platform uh, for aging. And that was uh, done in collaboration with, uh, with uh, actually a cosmetics company, uh, which was interesting on testing their drug, which is for anti-wrinkle. And the key thing, uh, and I put you a little bit on context, I didn't know that before, in fact, that we have the wrinkles because the, the older tissues tend to not to relax as fast as the young, and as the young uh, skin, let's say. So what we did here it was not only to create the model, but also to age it with a uh, tumor necrosis factor. It was added there and then we could see how the, the, the resulting um, the resulting tissue was similar to the one that you could see in, in, uh, in, in all patients. And then by using the same platform, we were evaluating this relaxation time. You can see here how it is the contraction profile. And we were actually taking this relaxation time uh, into account, which was the key element to see that actually this was uh, like, uh, so let's say this cosmetic was working or not. So what we can observe is like uh, with the age system, the relaxation time is increased. And when such a drug is used, then you are able to decrease uh, uh, the relaxation time and and that said this platform can be used not only for this disease but it could be used for other purposes and and well what what we we did like uh, to use uh, this really well known cell laden ring that we know uh, we decided to to design a skeleton which was for uh, for an efficient motion at the end so it was like what 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 can we do like obviously we've seen really nice uh, designs which are inspired in nature we were not inspired in nature, we were inspired in engineering and this compliance system seems to us like almost perfect because it's it's uh, a structure a geometry which is really well known in, in engineering that which we could actually simulate with finite element analysis knowing exactly which was the stiffness depending on the design that we were implying and 
saying so, we were able not to only tune the, the stiffness of the skeleton that was um, providing for, for structural integrity for our robot, because we all know that such uh, cell laden systems tend to, to, to aggregate. So if they are not held by in a skeleton, let's say the redundancy, and that's why we call it a skeleton, then they, you just get a ball and it's not getting the right differentiation. So a structural integrity, and at the same time, we wanted to be bended in a certain manner. This manner means that we wanted it to have a buckling, a buckling that will be key to have the stability when it will be swinging. And that was done by, by introducing an element that uh, in, in, in plot the asymmetry in the system and therefore we got this bending. Uh, but as I tell you here, it's really interesting that when we are working with 3D printing, we can apply one more degree the, of control over the designs we are doing. It's not only about the material we are using, but if we properly tune this, the, the, the geometry that we are creating, we can also tune the properties of, uh, at least in this case, of a stiffness that we, we want for our robot. Here, I wanted to put this video because uh, I think that uh, it is especially remarkable how straightforward it was to create this robot. So it's simple, it, like the fabrication process once it had been optimized. And that's why we think that it's so uh, remarkable for the biohybrid community because it could be really reproduced in any lab I, I've been doing myself in some segment in, in Switzerland and I could reproduce absolutely everything with no problem and here when we create the ring uh, in that case we were doing a mold casting it was not a direct printing uh, more for um, we wanted more like a mass production system you can see how easy it is to assemble such a complying a skeleton to the ring and the ring by being just a circle we were ensuring that it has the same um, the same shape all over of it. So here is where you see our our little biobots like beating uh, with the spontaneous contractions itself and it's very nice to, to remark that this was in fact the key element of our uh, skeleton. This spring-like skeleton is introducing self-stimulation to our system. This is amazing because that means that during all the differentiation process, our robot is constantly being stimulated by their own, um, by their own spontaneous contractions. It's not exactly like this, but what actually this mechanical um, or compliant, the restoring force that the, the, the cell scaffold is implying to the system when such contractions are taking place, it's bringing back the, the force to the, to, the, to the muscle. And then this really results in, in very high, um, high forces, as you will see later on. I just wanted to depict really fast how we, we created the cell light and system. You've seen how we've grown the cells. You've seen hands-on how we move this, this cell light and uh, circular uh, scaffold around the the compliant skeleton and you've seen how this backing effect is taking place and all over it you can see here a real image of how aligned the the cells are in uh, after the the differentiation process and how it is this compliant mechanism in the system i told you that we are going to measure the force in our system when the the system was in, in in this skeleton you see that we have a lot of spontaneous but when we electrostimulate we have very defined uh, contraction and then you see in this two post system in the same days when it was in this spontaneous uh, that we couldn't see any spontaneous contractions that's nothing bad about the system it could still bend but the force was much higher when our system was self uh, stimulated in uh, through this make process that the spring-like skeleton was providing. So that really helped us to have a stronger actuators that when they were in, in, in the liquid and stimulated at certain frequencies by the electrodes that you see here, we could see that they were moving by inertia in an step-like uh, motion, right? It's important this little leg was not only helping us on, on terms of the stiffness, but it was helping us on a stability when it was uh, at the interface, such robot. And the higher the frequency, the higher the velocity of the robot that we had. 
this uh, study didn't only stop at experimental results, but we also did uh, the, the corresponding simulations of the hydrodynamics around the system to understand how this uh, inertial motion was taking place. And it was indeed demonstrated. And, and then finally, I wanted just to show you how this motion is comparable to others. It's true that uh, to people who's not that familiarized to, to the biohybrid robots could think that it's not that fast. And I'm talking more because I normally was referring to nano micro motors. And when you talk about body length per minute, it's really high, right? In that case, the feel, I feel that it's more at its infancy and it's not that fast. So the, the, the design has a still to be refined, but we see that with this new design that we develop, we are more or less in the middle of the performance of the cardiac uh, base living systems which are really really good and and also uh, when we just refer to a swimming system or to a swimming platform based on a skeletal muscle base by your robots we have uh, developed a robot which is actually moving 790 times faster is that important obviously it is to understand how remarkable is the speed of, of the system but I would like to, to emphasize here how nice it could be to uh, exploit this kind of a structure to have like uh, higher forces in other kind of actuators that people is currently developing so to think a little bit out of the box and not copy so much nature but try to imply or have modular systems which at least include some of such training uh, protocols that are inherent to the system with of an external stimuli. So as a conclusion and to give an overview of what I explained, uh, we developed a system with a compliant skeleton and where the actuator is based on a skeletal muscle cells and uh, whose main key point is this mechanical self-stimulation, which is able to happen because there is these spontaneous contractions coming from other from our skeletal muscle cells and then the restoring force from the spring is, is helping with this mechanical stimulation. Uh, we really think that this could be, as I told you, helpful for other configurations, but also as I already demonstrated to you how such platforms can be tuned to be efficient drug testing platforms. And we also would like to think that in the future, these biohybrid systems can be helpful for biohybrid prosthetics, as we've seen that the force output uh, is much higher than in just uh, other systems, that the systems that which are just printed and led to mature in conditions which, uh, or at least let's say, in which the platform is not dynamically adapting to the, the skeletal muscle uh, hydrogel to imply uh, constant stress to it and therefore to ensure a good maturation. And that, that said, I wouldn't like to, to finish uh, this talk without thanking to everyone uh, of, of this group and especially to the BioRobots team, which are like highlighted here in green, and uh, especially to Samo Sanchez for believing in this, in this project, which had been uh, taking as much longer time that we expected, but which it's really rewarding and we are really happy with what, what we are working right now. Thank you very much for all the time and for your attention and, and for having the opportunity to present this work here in this conference. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, interesting talk. Okay, so now it's the uh, question and answer period. So is there any question or comment? So if you have a uh, question or comment, so please raise your hand and uh, uh, please say your question or comment. So is there any question or comment? Looks like we've got um, Saul Schaefer oh, has his hand raised. Yes. So fantastic talk. It was really cool to hear about your work. I had actually previously read the paper and it's nice to sort of get that perspective from uh, the first author sort of in a conference setting. I had a quick question about your choice to make the muscle actuators from a mold rather than bioprinting them. You sort of mentioned briefly that the decision was motivated from like a production standpoint that you might be able to sort of mass produce them from a mold rather than bioprinting. Can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, like uh, we have to say, or I have to say that nowadays we are more focused just on bioprinting them. So that was more because we were developing or we were really interested on, on how to tune this, this skeleton. And honestly, at that time, our bioing was not responding as efficiently as we would uh, go for. But now we optimize that and we have really, really nice scarfos. I don't know if you've seen, probably was not that noticeable, but in the first slide, the, the muscle which was contracting, it had like kind of different directions a bit and we are really happy about that because this is what happens when you bioprint that instead of doing the mold right with the mold you just have a directional one but now we really want to play with this real microfiber hierarchical structure and we actually did um, the the biggest one we did it was like eight fibers thick so we were doing like this one which was eight fibers and it's pretty amazing the um, the force but especially like how uh, I mean I'm more I'm more the one who designs not too much evaluate the biological system but how synchronic it is the, the 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 response of the different fibers that we constructed to so to respond to your question yes i think that and now in the new designs we want to bioprint them because they are providing higher forces also because it's expected if you have like thinner fibers you have a better nutrients distribution within the fibers but also the the response of the actuator itself we really think that we can play along a lot with the number of fibers and also how we combine the angles with between them and how we play with these contraction patterns, right? A bit. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, we can accept uh, one more question. So the, please, uh, Professor Tadakuma. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, please. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Maria. Very uh, imp impressive talk. And my name is Kenjiro Tadakuma in to from Tohoku University Japan, and I'd like to ask you about the uh, the shape of the um, the artificial muscles by made uh, made by the bio three D printing. So now at present, the, your uh, design of the uh, and the shape of the muscle is the um, it has the height, but the the same configuration, right? Same shape. You it's mean like the skeleton, right? So you you so are you you mean more the skeleton rather than the ah uh, yes skeleton right? mm, okay like, fine yes. fine mm. yes so so it means the uh fat, as, as a next step what kind of the um the skeleton it means the shape of the uh, as a three dimensional by, uh, because the, it's really really uh, f free to make the, uh, or set the shape right. Totally so, Dave, what do you think about that? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. But yeah. I, I honestly think that the future is without the skeletons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Funny enough, like it's, it's, there are some constraints, obviously, for the time life of the robots that you are developing, right? Because, uh, as I said, that gives some mechanical integrity to the system. Mm -hmm. But um, but that said, the latest skeletons we are trying to do, so the latest designs we are trying to do is without the skeleton. So we try to, to and we've seen, and, um, and hopefully we can get published that soon, we've seen that uh, training them in a certain shape, it creates generally some, some stresses that when you release the, the skeleton, there is a self-assembly, which is always consistent, getting an asymmetric structure. So you get more a biobot, which is really just bio right it's more like these frog like systems mm -hmm. um and and for that we are not skipping the skeleton like the spring like a skeleton because it's really useful for mechanical training right mm -hmm. so we use it just for training mm -hmm. but um so far uh we've been trying other structures but you have to think something if you want to get into the design of such skeletons or bio hybrid systems having mm -hmm as an um, artificial and biological, it is like the skeleton is heavy, right? So be careful on what you develop. It has to be it has to be stable. That's why it had this little leg. It's always but obviously you are free to 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 dream when it comes to designs. I, I really believe that because I can do the new ones we did without the skeleton they move much faster. But uh, also, it's again, it's not as consistent the motion, right? It, you always have mm. problems with that. But if you want to design some, if I would have to say which kind of design I would go towards, it's something which is thinner and better, let's say, to go to less resolution, right? Because you really have to have like something stable but less heavy. Um, for, mm. 
Okay. So in the fabrication process, do you think the, it, you need to put some the um the supporter to keep the shape of the yeah skeleton? for a while? Yes. No. No. I. I. I so, it's not that I believe. Mm. I, I try to do it without, <laughs> and and it's a total fail. Mm. So it gets into a ball. Um, and as I told you, one of the key aspects of this skeleton, apart from the mechanical training, is which is adapting to the stress from the, from the external scaffold, right? You don't have any more two paws which are fixed. You have a skeleton which, when it is pressed, it is giving back the force. And that creates an, 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 a constant uh, stress on the, on, the, on the tissue, which is key to get this alignment and a higher force output. Mm, really interesting. Mm, we can may, maybe we can put some of the biodegradable uh, materials as a support materials or four dimensional printing. Sure. We can so four dimensional supporter for and the biological. Imagine if, if you do something or if you work with something which you can change the properties, so to say, like mm, um, yeah, a system, so, would you change it? Then you can adapt the size of your skeleton depending on the maturation moment or size that you want, right? So you can tune a bit the properties by that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, totally. And if it's biodegradable, like much better. Mm -hmm. Sure. Very interesting. Thank you very much. For it. Thanks for your question. And thank you, Masahiro Sensei. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so the, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maria Gush. So the, let me move on to the next.